Welcome all to the session on chamber enlargement. By the end of the session, you will be able to identify right atrial abnormality, left atrial abnormality, left ventricular uh, hypertrophy and dilatation and right ventricular hypertrophy and dilatation in the ECG. First, I would like to tell you the difference between enlargement and hypertrophy. The term enlargement is used when there is volume overload of the ventricle causing eccentric hypertrophy that is there is dilatation of the chamber of the heart. The term hypertrophy is used when there is pressure overload of the ventricle causing concentric hypertrophy that is there is increase in the thickness of the myocardial wall. So, we will be using these terms throughout the session. So, first we will see about right atrial abnormality. So, we all know that the impulses originate in the SA node. From there, the depolarization spreads to the right atrium and to the left atrium. The net vector of this is in this direction and the normal P wave axis is between plus 30 to plus 75 degrees. Now, let us see what happens in a right atrial abnormality. In right atrial abnormality, there is a stronger right atrial vector and a normal left atrial vector. This will cause the P wave axis to shift clockwise and in right atrial abnormality, the P wave axis will be more than plus 75 degrees. In left atrial abnormality, there is a stronger left atrial vector. This will cause the P wave axis to shift anti-clockwise and in left atrial abnormality, the P wave axis is less than plus 30 degree. So, that is the first difference. In right atrial abnormality, the P wave axis will be shifted clockwise more than plus 75 degrees and in left atrial abnormality, the P wave axis will be shifted anti-clockwise that is less than plus 30 degrees. So, we will see the morphology of P wave. So, if you remember in lead 2, the P wave is having two components, the right atrial component and the left atrial component. The normal amplitude of P wave in lead 2 is 0.25 millivolt and the duration is less than 0.12 second. In lead 1, the P wave is having a biphasic shape, the positive component contributed by the right atrium and the negative component contributed by the left atrium. The amplitude of each of this complex is 0.1 millivolt and the duration is 0.04 second. So, now let us see what happens in a right atrial abnormality. So, in lead 2, the initial component which is contributed by the right atrium will be more, will be increased in amplitude and the latter component contributed by the left atrium will remain the same. So, what happens? In lead 2, in right atrial abnormality, the amplitude of the P wave increases. It will be more than 0.25 millivolt, whereas the duration remains the same, less than 0.12 second. Now, let us see in V1. In V1, the right atrium, the positive uh, component of the biphasic wave is contributed by the right atrium. So, that will be increased in amplitude. The negative component will remain the same. So, in V1, in right atrial abnormality, you will see a tall uh, positive deflection and a small negative deflection. The duration will remain the same. So, to summarize, in right atrial abnormality, we will see tall P wave in both limb and right precordial leads. A positive deflection of P wave is seen in lead V1 or V2 more than 0.15 millivolt. There is no increase in the total duration of P wave and the P wave axis in the frontal plane is more than plus 75 degrees. ECG 1, we will see lead 2 and V1. We see P wave in lead 2 and V1 because P wave axis is in the direction of lead 2 and V1 being the right precordial lead. So, here if you see the lead 2 and V1, what are we seeing? Here we have a very tall P wave of amplitude more than 4 millimeter. And in V1, if you see, there is a biphasic P wave with the positive deflection more than 0.1 millivolt. So, this is an ECG suggestive of right atrial abnormality. 
there are many other changes in this ECG but right now we will concentrate on lead 2 and V1. Now let us move on to left atrial abnormality. Left atrial abnormality unlike right atrial abnormality it causes inter atrial conduction disturbance in which the duration of the middle and the terminal component of the P wave is prolonged owing to delayed left atrial activation. So, we already discussed about the P wave axis there is an anti clockwise shift in the P wave axis and the P wave axis will be less than plus 30 degrees. Let us see the morphology of P wave in left atrial abnormality. So, the initial component in D2 which is contributed by the right atrium remains the same whereas the one contributed by the left atrium is now prolonged. So, how do we how do we see it in the ECG? We see a notched P wave in lead 2 with amplitude remaining the same but the duration more than 0.12 second and in between these two humps there should be at least one small square. In lead V1 the positive deflection contributed by the right atrium remains the same whereas the negative deflection is now deeper and broader increases in both amplitude and duration. The amplitude will be more than 0.1 millivolt and the duration will be more than 0.04 second. In left atrial abnormality so the P wave is notched with the duration of 0.12 second or more this is called as P mitral in lead 2 and the two humps are separated by at least one small block. There is a leftward shift in the P wave axis in the frontal plane to plus 15 degrees or beyond. A P terminal force in v lead V1 equal to or more negative than 0.04 millivolt second. So, what is P terminal force? It is nothing but the product of the amplitude and duration of the negative component of P wave in V1. So, we already told this amplitude and duration both are increased in case of left atrial abnormality. So, this P terminal force will be more than 0.04 millivolt second in left atrial abnormality. This is called as Morris index. Combined sensitivity of P terminal force in V1 more than 0.04 millivolt second and P wave duration more than 100 millisecond is much more in diagnosing left atrial abnormality. So, let us see this ECG lead 2 and V1 we can see here. So, what do you see here? What do you see here? In lead 2 the P wave is looking bifid or notched and if you see carefully between the two humps there is one small square. One small square between two humps and in V1 what are you seeing? There is a positive component and a negative component which is increased in duration prolonged more than 40 millisecond. So, if you calculate the P terminal force it will come more than 0.04 millivolt second. So, satisfying the Morris index. So, this is an ECG suggestive of left atrial abnormality. So, what happens in a biatrial enlargement? In case of a biatrial enlargement uh, both these findings, both the findings of left atrial abnormality and right atrial abnormality will be present. That is, there will be a large diphasic P wave in V1 with an initial positive component more than 1.5 millimeter and a terminal negative component more than 1 millimeter in amplitude and more than 0.04 second in duration or both. Or if there is a tall peaked P wave in right precordial lead and a wide notched P wave in the limb lead or left precordial lead like V5, V6 that is also suggestive of left biatrial enlargement. It is called as P tricuspidal or there will be an increase in both amplitude and duration of P wave in limb lead. So, a combination of findings of right atrial abnormality and left atrial abnormality are seen in ECG if there is a biatrial enlargement. So, let us see this ECG. Let us concentrate on lead V1. So, what do you see there? In lead V1, there is a positive deflection which is well more than 1 millimeter in amplitude and a negative deflection 
of duration more than 40 milliseconds. So, there are findings of suggestive of both right atrial and left atrial abnormality. So, this ECG is suggestive of biatrial enlargement. So, how will you identify atrial enlargement in presence of atrial fibrillation? In atrial fibrillation, you will not see a P wave. Instead, you will see something called as fibrillatory waves, which are seen as baseline disturbances. So, you will see something called as fibrillatory waves and not P waves. So, how will you identify atrial enlargement? So, you see the fibrillatory waves. If there are coarse fibrillatory waves, that means the fibrillatory waves with amplitude more than 1 millimeter, it is suggestive of an atrial enlargement even in presence of atrial fibrillation. So, to summarize, in right atrial enlargement, the amplitude of the P wave is more in lead 2 and the positive deflection will be of more amplitude in V1. In left atrial enlargement, there is a notched P wave in with increased duration in uh, lead 2 and uh, normal positive deflection and a broader and deeper negative deflection P wave in V1. A combination of these findings are seen in biatrial enlargement. So, now let us move on to left ventricular hypertrophy and dilatation. So, we already told the impulses originate from the sinoatrial node, they spread to the AV node and from there uh, right ventricle is depolarized, then left ventricle is depolarized. The net vector of this will be in the direction, in this direction of lead 2 and the normal QRS axis is between minus 30 degree to plus 90 degree minus 30 degree to plus 90 degree. So, what happens in left ventricular enlargement? In left ventricular enlargement, there is a stronger left ventricular vector which shifts the P QRS axis anti-clockwise or leftward and the left axis deviation will be there of more than minus 30 degrees in left ventricular enlargement. So, the ECG, the sensitivity of ECG to diagnose left ventricular hypertrophy is limited. So, many criteria are being proposed to diagnose left ventricular hypertrophy in ECG. Most of these criteria rely on increased QRS voltage. That is because when the left ventricle is hypertrophic, that means the thickness of the left ventricular myocardium is more. So, the amplitude of the QRS complex will also be more. So, let us see in the frontal plane, I am concentrating two leads V1 and V6, V1 being the right precordial lead and V6 being the left precordial lead. So, this is the normal uh, ECG in a V1, lead V1. So, here we can see a small R wave and a deep S wave. This R is contributed to the, by the right ventricle and S is contributed by the left ventricle. In left ventricular hypertrophy, this S will be deepened. The S which, which is contributed by the left ventricle will be deepened and you get a small r deep S in V1. This if there is a small r deep S like this in V1, it is suggestive of left ventricular hypertrophy. What happens in V6? In normally, V6 will have a because it is a left precordial lead. So, the V6 will have a tall R wave contributed by the left ventricle and a small S wave which is contributed by the right ventricle. So, in left ventricular hypertrophy, there is an increase in the amplitude of this R wave contributed by the left ventricle. So, there are some pointers hmm, for left ventricular hypertrophy. Uh, in the ECG, one I already told you increased to QRS voltage. The second one is a left atrial abnormality. During diastole, when the mitral valve is open, the left ventricle and left atrium behaves like a common chamber and any pressure or volume differences in the left ventricle is reflected to the left atrium also. So, the presence of an associated left atrial abnormality is a pointer for left ventricular hypertrophy. And ventricular activation time is the time taken for the impulse to travel through the myocardium to reach the recording electrode. 
In case of a left ventricular hypertrophy, since the thickness of the myocardium is more, this ventricular activation time which is measured from the beginning of the QRS complex to the peak of the R wave, it is prolonged. Usually it be less than 0.05 second, here it will be prolonged to more than 0.05 second. The intrinsicoid deflection is the point from which this uh, impulse reaches the recording electrode and so because the ventricular activation time is prolonged, the intrinsicoid de deflection is also delayed. It is evidently seen in the left precordial leads that is V5 and V6. If the amplitude of R in V6 is more than or equal to the R in V5 that is also suggestive of left ventricular hypertrophy. Because in left ventricular hypertrophy there is some abnormality in depolarization, especially in a concentric hypertrophy it is associated with abnormalities in repolarization, abnormalities in STT segments. The two most commonly used repolarization criteria for diagnosis of LVH are QRS T angle more than 100 degree and the T wave which is upright in V2 and more negative than 0.1 millivolt in V6. So, in addition to the findings which we mentioned above, if you see abnormalities in ST segment and T wave that is also suggestive of left ventricular hypertrophy. The reciprocal changes are also present in the right precordial leads with ST elevation and a tall TV. There are a few criteria which are used commonly in clinical practice to diagnose left ventricular hypertrophy in the ECG. The most commonly used one is Zoclo Leon index. So, it says that the uh, uh, amplitude of R in V5 or V6 plus the amplitude of S in V1, if it is more than or equal to 35 millimeter, it is suggestive of left ventricular hypertrophy. If the amplitude of R wave in AVL is more than 11 millimeter, that is also suggestive of left ventricular hypertrophy. Then another commonly used criteria is coronal voltage criteria. So, it says that the sum of the amplitude of R in AVL with S in V3, if it is more than 28 millimeter in men or 20 millimeter in women, it is suggestive of left ventricular hypertrophy. Coronal product is the coronal voltage multiplied by QRS duration in milliseconds. And if it is more than or equal to 2440 milliseconds, it is also suggestive of left ventricular hypertrophy. Then we have Romhild and Estes criteria. They assign points to certain parameters like three points are given if there is evidence of left atrial abnormality or any increase in the voltage of QRS complex as evidenced by an R or S in limb lead more than or equal to 20 millimeter, S in V1 or V2 more than or equal to 30 millimeter, R in V5 or V6 more than or equal to 30 millimeter or any STT abnormalities without digoxin. Two points are given if there is a left axis deviation of more than minus 30 degrees and one point is given if there is a slight widening of QRS complex more than 0.09 seconds and intrinsicoid deflection in V5, V6 more than or equal to 0.05 second and ST segment or T abnormalities with digoxin. So, intrinsicoid deflection I hope you understood it is calculated from the beginning of the QRS complex to the peak of the R wave, the duration of that. If it is more than 0.05 second we say that there is a prolonged ventricular activation time or delay in intrinsicoid deflection. So, if the total score is more than or equal to 5 points then it is diagnostic of LVH in the ECG a score of 4 points is suggestive of probable LVH. Other ECG changes which are seen in LVH are a total QRS voltage that is the sum of the amplitude of all the QRS voltage in the ECG more than 175 millimeter, presence of an incomplete left bundle branch block, attenuation of a small initial Q in the left oriented leads, abnormal large Q in the inferior leads, a small equiphasic 
RS complex in AVF or a U wave amplitude which is increased in right leads or inverted in left leads. These are also pointers to left ventricular hypertrophy. So, we have seen like all the criteria we have discussed so far uses the amplitude or the QRS voltage to diagnose LVH. But there are some condition in which there will be left ventricular hypertrophy without increased voltage in the QRS complex like obesity, peripheral edema, anasarca, lung diseases like emphysema, patients with large breast, biventricular hypertrophy, pericardial effusion, pleural effusion, etc. So, in all these conditions, you will get a ECG without increased voltage, but the patient will be having left ventricular hypertrophy. There are some conditions in which there is increased QRS voltage not resulting from LVH like adolescent boys, patients with anemia, patients who underwent left mastectomy or thin individuals. So, these conditions have to be kept in mind whenever you are reading the ECG of any patient. So, this is ECG number 4. So, what are we seeing here? Let us concentrate on the V1 to V6 chest leads. So, let us apply Zoclo Leon index here. So, we will calculate the amplitude of S in V1. It is coming around 20 millimeter and we are calculating the amplitude of R in V6. It is coming 25. So, the sum of these two is more than 35 millimeter. So, satisfying the Zoclo Leon index. Let us see the AVL, the amplitude of R in AVL, it is more than 11 millimeter. So, that is also suggestive of left ventricular hypertrophy. If you apply the coronal voltage criteria, we can see that R in AVL plus S in V3. So, R itself here is 15, S is coming around 25, 15 plus 25, it is well more than 28 millimeter. So, according to coronal voltage criteria also, this is suggestive of left ventricular hypertrophy. If you apply the Romhilt and Estes criteria, there is evidence of left, left ventricular hypertrophy as evidenced by increased QRS voltage, yes, well beyond 30 millimeter in the leads. So, yes, that is giving 3 points and there are STT abnormalities that is also giving 3 points. So, the score is well beyond 5. So, according to Romhilt and Estes criteria also, this ECG is having left ventricular hypertrophy. Now, let us see right ventricular hypertrophy and dilatation. So, in right ventricular hypertrophy, there is a stronger right ventricular vector which shifts the net QRS axis rightward or clockwise and there is a right axis deviation of more than or equal to 90 degree. But here you have to understand that normally itself left ventricular muscle mass is much more than the right ventricle. So, unless the right ventricle is severely hypertrophied, this kind of axis deviation will not be there in the ECG. So, in the frontal plane, in right ventricular hypertrophy, there will be a tall R wave and a small S wave because I already told you the initial R is contributed by the right ventricle. So, in comparison, I have given the left ventricular hypertrophy ECG also. So, in right ventricular hypertrophy, you get a tall R, small S, whereas in left ventricular hypertrophy, you get a small R, deep S in lead V1. In lead V6, in right ventricular hypertrophy, you are getting an R wave which is contributed by the left ventricle and a deeper S wave which is contributed by the right ventricle. Whereas, in left ventricular hypertrophy, you are getting a tall R wave in V6. So, the pointers for right ventricular hypertrophy in the ECG are right axis deviation of more than or equal to 90 degree, QR complex or a small q tall r in V1 or an R wave of amplitude more than 7 millimeter in V1 or an RS ratio of more than or equal to 1 in V1. Similar to left ventricular hypertrophy, in right ventricular hypertrophy also, because the right ventricular muscle mass is increased, there is a delayed onset of intrinsicoid deflection in V1 more than 0.03 second. We will see a small r deep S complex in the left oriented leads and an equiphasic RS complex in the 
mid precordial leads in adults sometimes we see an s1 s2 s3 pattern that is a deep s is seen in lead 1 2 3 which is also suggestive of right ventricular hypertrophy presence of right atrial abnormality or right bundle branch block may also be seen similar to left ventricular hypertrophy we can see st segment and t wave changes in the form of st depression and t inversion in right precordial leads like v1 and v2 three types of right ventricular hypertrophy are identified type a it is the typical rvh pattern with anterior and rightward displacement of the main qrs vector type b is the one in which we will see an incomplete bundle branch block and type c there is posterior and rightward displacement of the main QRS axis. It is seen predominantly in patients with chronic lung disease like emphysema in that the lead V1 may look normal. But we will see a deep S wave in the left precordial leads with right axis deviation. So, I would like to mention about the uh, ECG in chronic pulmonary disease. In chronic pulmonary disease like uh, emphysema, there is over inflation of the lung which will push diaphragm downward. So, the heart is now aligned vertically. P, Q, R, S, T wave axis, everything is shifted rightward and inferiorly towards lead AVF. Since lead 1 is perpendicular to lead AVF, lead 1 will show very small deflection. This is called as lead 1 sign in COPD. In addition, there will be poor R wave progression in the ECG also. So, this is ECG number 5. So, what are we seeing here? So, in V1, we are seeing a tall R and small s. The R is definitely more than 7 millimeter in amplitude. The RS ratio is definitely more than 1. And there are, we can see the STT changes also. Can you see the STT changes in V1, V2, V3? So, that is also suggestive of right ventricular hypertrophy. This looks like a type A right ventricular hypertrophy pattern. So, let us see this ECG. In this, in V1, we are seeing a QR pattern, a small Q, tall R and there is in V2 and V3, we can see a right bundle branch block pattern also. So, this may be type B right ventricular hypertrophy. Here if you see here we have a uh, ECG suggestive of a right atrial abnormality also. In combined ventricular hypertrophy a combination of these findings are seen. Combination of left ventricular and right ventricular hypertrophy findings will be seen. There is increased voltage of QRS complex especially over the transition zones that is lead V3 and V4 we will see a tall or deep S or there will be left ventricular hypertrophy with right axis deviation or right atrial abnormality or a left atrial enlargement with an RS ratio in V5, V6 less than or equal to 1 or S in V5, V6 more than or equal to 7 millimeter or a right axis deviation of more than plus 90 degrees or if there is a voltage discordance between limb and precordial leads. If you see tall R in Right, left precordial leads, tall R in left precordial, uh, right precordial leads and large equiphasic QRS in the mid precordial leads, then this is called as cat Wachtel phenomenon that is also suggestive of combined ventricular hypertrophy. So, I will show you an ECG. Here we are seeing tall R in right precordial that is V1, tall R is seen in left precordial lead that is V6 and in the mid precordial lead we have kind of an equiphasic RS complex. So, this is called as cat Wachtel phenomenon and this is indicative of combined ventricular hypertrophy. In heart failure you will see a combination of these findings. There may be findings suggestive of left ventricular enlargement, right ventricular enlargement, left atrial abnormality, right atrial abnormality, any combination is possible. In addition, we will see arrhythmias like uh, atrial fibrillation, premature ventricular complex, atrial ectopics, 
so those kind of arrhythmias may be present. In addition, the patient may have complete left bundle branch block or right bundle branch block in the ECG. When these findings are present, we suspect heart failure. We have to do an echo to confirm systolic or diastolic dysfunction of the heart. These are my references. Thank you.